team, I mean, with uh, including the, uh, the quantum uh, quantum uh, Hall effect, and uh, this is one of the important themes of the RQ uh, EMP, uh, RQMP, <laughs> the study of. Uh, Topology, the effect of topology on, uh, on materials. Another recurring theme is the, the theme of uh, interactions. And on the experimental side, I guess one of the most interesting uh, discoveries uh, as far as uh, 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 tools are concerned, I guess, is the Scannington link microscopy, which was discovered quite a few decades ago, but is always progressing and showing us more and more of the details of, uh, of nature on the atomic uh, scale. So today we are lucky to have uh, someone who will tell us about all these things together, namely uh, topology and so surface states are very important, as you know, uh, their interactions and how we can probe them at a rather uh, deep level. So uh, she has done uh, her PhD at Princeton in the group of Yali, Ali Yazdani, who is a, a world expert on the scanning telling macroscopy. And uh, she presently holds a prestigious uh, Papalardo uh, fellowship uh, at, uh, at MIT. So uh, please uh, welcome uh, Malika Randeria. So while she uh, shares her screen, I will uh, just tell you about questions. So uh, she's open to have uh, questions as uh, she's talking. So you can just hold the uh, space bar uh, while you speak that will unmute you. And when you release it, uh, it will mute again. So that's a convenient way of doing it. You can also use the chat that I will uh, monitor. Uh, she will pause once in a while to ask her questions. And there will be obviously questions at the end, which we hope can go on for, uh, for a while. So uh, the floor is to you, uh, Marika. Great. Can you see my screen? Yeah, it's perfect. Screen? Okay, great. Thank you so much. This, although I would have loved to visit in person, it's a great pleasure to be giving this talk to all of you. And I heard a bit about this wonderful Quantum Institute with so many different universities coming together. So. I'm very much looking forward to all my meetings today. And yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and for this invitation. And like Andre Marie said, I'm going to share with you research. And this was work that I did during my PhD in Ali Yazdani's group. And so mostly what I'm going to talk about is really exactly this bringing together topology and interactions and novel phenomena that can arise specifically from spontaneous symmetry breaking in the quantum Hall regime. So in particular, I will focus on these pneumatic quantum Hall states and I will talk about what they are. So I will discuss what these states are and how we can identify them by directly imaging their wave functions using a scanning tunneling microscope. And then finally, in the last part of my talk, I will show you some really intriguing interaction effects that can occur between at the boundaries between different pneumatic domains. So pneumatic phases are analogs of liquid crystal phases. And in liquid crystals, you have these molecules that are elongated, some long chain of molecules that all align so that they have a preferential directionality to them. And so in pneumatic phases, it's the electronic states themselves that have an orientation to them. And these states essentially break the rotational symmetry of the underlying crystal lattice. And so there's some anisotropy in the electronic behavior of materials. And this idea was first inspired by the experimental observation of stripe phases and high temperature superconductors and has also been seen in a number of other materials like gallium arsenide at uh, half filling states or strontium ruthenate. And so typically in transport measurements that are used to probe these kinds of anisotropies, 
the experiments involve measuring some response such as resistivity across two different crystallographic axes and the results show some large asymmetry sorry so i want you to look at like this plot for example along these some large asymmetry and say resistivity along two different crystallographic axes and now the key question here is whether these states arise spontaneously that is whether they're a result of electron-electron interactions, or um, is there some underlying breaking of the crystalline symmetry itself? And so one platform in which we wanted to look for these kinds of broken symmetry states where interactions are known to dominate is the quantum Hall regime. And so this is a different platform in which we're going to look for these ideas of pneumaticity and rotational symmetry breaking. So to think about quantum Hall, you should essentially picture some electrons confined to two dimensions, some two-dimensional plane in the presence of a large out-of-plane magnetic field. And so what this field does is it causes these charged electrons to undergo cyclotron motion because of the Lorentz force. Essentially, the electrons in the bulk of the crystal go in these orbits, circular orbits, and at the edges you have these conducting edge states. So these quantum Hall states have intrinsic topological order, as you all know. And then if you want to think about what, do, what uh, the picture for this in terms of some density of states, you essentially have a large number of degenerate states at certain discrete energies. And so that gives you these peaks in the density of states, which are known as Landau levels. And now we can introduce this idea of symmetry breaking coming from additional degrees of freedom in this system. So you can have a spin degree of freedom or other pseudo spin degrees of freedom such as valley or orbital or layer degrees of freedom. And what this does is adds an additional degeneracy to your Landau levels. And then interactions come in when you look um, at what happens when you change the filling of one of these Landau levels. So if you partially fill a Landau level. And now let, for a moment, let's just imagine having um, a spin up, spin down, just two, two spin degrees of freedom. Then if we partially fill one of these Landau levels, it becomes energetically favorable due to Coulomb interactions to only occupy, say, the spin up states and open this exchange gap to the spin down states. And this behavior is sometimes known as quantum Hall ferromagnetism, or you can think about Hund's rule and filling orbitals in an atom. It's essentially the same exchange interaction that opens up this gap only when the Landau level is partially filled. So here's your Fermi energy or, or chemical potential. And now you can also have systems where it's not just spin degrees of freedom, but for example, graphene has both spin and valley degrees of freedom. So you have a complete SU4 symmetry that can get broken as well. And typically transport probes use um, edge modes to identify these kinds of quantum Hall ferromagnetism in uh, these states, similar to how just quantum Hall states were first observed. You see these quantized conductance plateaus and these have been studied using bulk measurements in gallium arsenide and graphene. And now I just want to introduce this idea of saying there, with these different spin and valley and other degrees of freedom, you can have all sorts of fantastic configurations and a wide variety of different wave functions, a different, different ground states, such as you could have some ferromagnetic state, you could have some charge density type of state, and all of these different states would have unique wave functions that haven't really been probed and imaged very directly. And so this is one arena in which local probes can give you a complementary picture to what's occurring, the physics, that's the physical phenomena that's occurring in these systems, and complement the uh, bulk measurements that, such as transport. The other, um, place where local probes come in is if you think about excitations in these systems where you have some spontaneous symmetry breaking and you essentially, let's say, occupy all of the spin up and, and, and then if you add an excitation, which is one spin down to the system, 
These excitations are a local excitation, which is likely to give you a skirmion where you could have some spatial variation in your spin texture or pseudo spin texture. And moreover, if we're thinking about um, spontaneous symmetry breaking, then you expect to have domains with different uh, lowest energy states. And these are very well suited to being probed locally. Whereas bulk techniques typically uh, need to average out over the entire sample to observe some response. And so today what I'm going to show you is using local probes to image this kind of symmetry breaking and specifically looking at pneumatic order in these quantum Hall states. So to give you just a cartoon picture to keep in your mind of a model pneumatic system, consider a, a system, this is with multiple anisotropic valleys. So this is in the uh, in momentum space that it has two Fermi pockets that you can see here, these two ellipses that are elongated. They're ellipses and not circular. And so what this means is that if this is your momentum space picture of your brilliant zone, then electrons in this material have a double degeneracy coming from this valley degree of freedom now. And if we think about what's happening in real space, the cyclotron orbits of these electrons also reflect the anisotropy of the valleys from which they arise. And so you can either have electrons which have um, cyclotron orbits, which have a long axis along the vertical direction or a long axis along the horizontal direction. And this anisotropy in the Fermi surface here is just coming from a difference in effective mass along the kx versus the ky direction. But what this means is now if we have states where we lift this twofold valley degeneracy, we can get into this pneumatic regime where the electronic states have a particular orientation to them and break the original fourfold symmetry of your a brilliant zone or crystal lattice here. So this forms a model pneumatic system where we can directly probe the pneumaticity just by looking at the shape of the Landau orbits. And we can further quantify the role of interactions in the system by looking spectroscopically for this kind of exchange splitting right when we tune the filling of the Landau level to the chemical potential. And finally, we expect to have domains here if this um, degeneracy is lifted spontaneously, where on one side it could be this that's the lowest um, energy state versus the other um, directionality. And these domains are particularly interesting to probe locally because we can use these local probes to distinguish the behavior in a domain versus at the domain wall. And so because these are quantum Hall domains, now we expect that the boundary will have these one dimensional modes. And so we can ask what kinds of interactions do we see at these boundaries? And how does specifically then the valley degree of freedom affect these interactions? And so this is just a broad um, overview of my talk now as I'm going to talk about valley ordering in the quantum Hall regime that occurs on the surface of bismuth. And so we see, we are able to observe directly these, a spontaneous breaking of the bismuth crystalline symmetry in the electronic states. And we see this kind of pneumatic behavior and we directly identify it by imaging the Landau level wave functions. And then finally, we are able to find a domain boundary between two different pneumatic domains and we look at interactions that occur at the domain wall. And so the technique that I studied extensively during my PhD is, was scanning tunneling microscopy. And uh, just to give you a brief introduction to STM, essentially it has a very sharp metallic tip that you bring close to a sample and measure tunneling of electrons from the tip into the sample through a vacuum barrier. And because tunneling is exponentially sensitive to the um, distance between your tip and your sample, we, uh, this technique allows you to get atomic resolution of surfaces. And so you can move your tip across the sample and ask 
to maintain a certain fixed tunneling current and observe how much this tip has to move in and out in the z direction to do so. And this allows you to map out the topography of the sample. And you can see we have beautiful atomic resolution of surfaces. Um, in addition to this um, atomic resolution imaging, STM is also very powerful in being able to do spectroscopy. So for that, we apply a bias voltage between the tip and the sample, and we can look at how much the tunneling current or the tunneling conductance DIDV changes. And so this DIDV tunneling conductance is directly proportional to a local density of states in your sample. And so the two kinds of measurements we can do here is either fix the STM at a particular location on the sample, and then um, I lost my here. There we go. And then look at how this tunneling conductance varies as a function of bias voltage. And so you get some spectrum that looks like this, some curve. Or you can say fix the energy, fix the bias voltage, and map out how this tunneling conductance is changing over a certain area of your sample. And so this gives you these kinds of conductance maps that you see here at a particular energy. And so these are the basically three types of data that I will be showing you in my talk specifically for our business system. So I just briefly want to show you the STM that we have that I use during my PhD. Ali has several STMs that are very state of the art, push boundaries in all directions. And this STM was a dilution refrigerator STM that went down to a temperature of 20 millikelvin phonon temperature, and we can measure the electron temperature, which was about an order of magnitude larger, at 250 millikelvin in our system. And it had a high magnetic field of 14 Tesla. So it was a very complicated, large instrument that could really push the boundaries in terms of going down to lowest temperatures, high fields, keeping the samples in ultra high vacuum so we could do very uh, measurements on very pristine surfaces. And so this is what allowed us to probe some of this beautiful physics that I'm going to show you today. Um, so the material that I studied or that I'm gonna talk about is bismuth. And bismuth is really a pioneering quantum material. It, it's a compensated semi-metal and it's extremely clean and this was the first material in which in the bulk itself quantum oscillations were seen. And bulk bismuth has proved to be very interesting over the years. There have been um, several studies looking at just bulk bismuth in high magnetic fields and low temperatures. And bulk bismuth itself has multiple degenerate valleys, as you can see here, the Fermi pockets that are all elongated. Um, so what we do a study with STM is we study surfaces. So we looked at the 111 surface of bismuth and there's large spin orbit coupling in this material which spin splits your surface state to give you these uh, a band structure which looks like this. So the yellow and blue bands are the bismuth uh, 111 surface states here. Um, Malika, mm -hmm. can I ask a question? So. Um... Is there any possibility of pushing the electron temperatures even lower? Uh, I mean, because this 20, 250 millikelvin is like in this regime where somehow a lot of, I mean, at least some spectroscopic features get missed out. And I was recently listening to um, Berthold Jack's talk also of observing Majoranas and similar thing there. It would be nice to be able to go to lower temperatures somehow, even lower temperatures. Yeah. Um... It could probably be pushed down to maybe half this value or so. I think there are like technical details that need to be figured out. It is something people are thinking about in terms of it. It just has to do with the wiring and thermal anchoring of the wires that are going down into your system. Uh -huh. Um, okay. STM is actually one of uh, like a unique system in which you can measure the electron temperature in a lot of other like just standard dilution fridges where people do transport. Most of the time you don't even measure your electron temperature. So the difference is if you stick some thermometer on your sample holder and measure, you're measuring some phonon temperature. The way we measure electron temperature is by 
measuring a superconducting gap spectrum, fitting it to a BCS, like some known BCS density of states, and you can see the thermal broadening of the coherence peaks there. I see. I see. So, Yes, it is something that people want to push, but it's technically quite challenging to do. Okay, all right, thanks. Great, so the bismuth 111 surface has a band structure which looks like this with these yellow and blue bands here. So there's large spin orbit coupling, which has lived, which lifts the spin degree of freedom. So there's no spin degeneracy. These bands are spin split now. And if you look at what the Fermi surface looks like, you can see that there are these multiple anisotropic valleys here, which should remind you of this model pneumatic system that I was talking about. So if we just go through this a bit slowly, you can see this central yellow band here around the gamma point that gives you a central pocket which is electron-like and this blue band here this gives you these hole-like pockets and you have six of them these elongated pockets and so this is an ARPES measurement of the bismuth 111 Fermi surface and if you look closely at these hole pockets you can see that they're not perfectly elliptical they actually have a teardrop shape to them which um, I will touch upon later. But the band structure of bismuth is very well understood and it's essentially the different effective masses along the kx and ky directions which is giving you this anisotropy here. And so this is what we will, what you should think about in relation to this model pneumatic system that I showed you. There are these the six, now here we have six fold degenerate pockets which will come into play when we look at valley ordering in this system. So what we do in our STM is we take a bismuth crystal and we cleave it to expose a very clean surface. And you can see on a large scale, we have many steps on the surface with um, step edges going along crystallographic axes. And if we zoom in just on one of these terraces here, it's very clean and we can also see the bismuth lattice, the atomic lattice underneath. And you can see that this lattice has some threefold rotational symmetry here. And now what we can do is sit at, with our STM, pick a very clean region of this surface and measure tunneling conductance. So look at the spectrum. And so here I'm plotting tunneling conductance as a function of energy at um, the lowest temperature, so this 250 millikelvin. And in zero magnetic field, we see some smooth curve, which is shown in green here. And already in this curve, we can identify these features, this drop in conductance here and this peak here, which match well to the energies of the Van Hove singularities in our band structure. And now what we do is we can go up in field. So at 14 Tesla, the same spectrum, now you see these very sharp peaks in your tunneling conductance. And this you should think of as uh, proportional to density of states. And so these peaks here are these Landau levels, which tell you that you have these large number of states at certain discrete energies. And that was already very exciting to see. And the story gets more exciting from here. So what we can do is we can look at the evolution of these, uh, the energy evolution of these Landau levels as a function of magnetic field and energy. So this in this Landau fan diagram here, we plot magnetic field on the y-axis, energy on the x-axis, and the color represents the height of one of these peaks. So this one spectrum is a line cut taken at a particular magnetic field. And so now what we see is we see that there are Landau levels which disperse from these six hole-like features here. We see these are these strong features here. We can identify the lowest Landau level, the n equals zero state. And we also have Landau levels coming from the central electron pocket, which are dispersing with a positive slope in magnetic field. And these are these uh, may, it might be a bit hard to see in the color plot, but they're coming from these states up here in energy. And right, so we have this one 
central electron Landau level, which is singly degenerate. And we're mostly going to focus on the six fold degeneracy coming from these six teardrop shaped valleys here. And so now what we want to do is we want to ultimately look for interaction effects. So look very close to the Fermi level, which is E equals zero. So this was the data that I was showing you on the previous slide. And now if we zoom in an energy and just look between uh, 20, minus 20 to 40 milli electron volts, here we can see these are these whole like Landau levels. And if you look closely, they're not just dispersing as straight lines, but one of these Landau levels, let's just look at this one here, it comes in and then it gets pinned to the Fermi level and then it continues to disperse on. And what that means, what that's telling you is that these states have, there are a large number of states at this one particular energy or small energy window here. And if we say we have a fixed carrier density, then as this one Landau level is being filled, it stays pinned to this Fermi level and then continues to disperse along. And from this, we can then extract the carrier density. And for the holes in this system, we get a density of about 7 times 10 to the 12 per centimeter square. And what this is showing you is that we can use magnetic field as a knob to essentially tune the filling of these Landau levels. By changing magnetic field, we can change the filling of these Landau levels here. And now we want to to say, okay, look for interaction effects, we're really going to zoom in right around the Fermi level here. And remember these whole like states had the six fold valley degeneracy. So now if we zoom in and look at an energy range, energy window of like plus minus three milli electron volts, and then this is in a smaller magnetic field range as well. Um, we see some uh, a data which looks like this. And so I will orient you a bit to this data. These levels that are crossing through, these are those electron-like states. And we're not really going to look at them in too much detail for this talk. This one state here, these actually these two states here, this is what was showing up on the previous slide as a single peak or just one band that you were seeing coming through, that's this n equals four Landau level. But now with this higher energy resolution data, you can see that it's actually split. And we have this splitting here. If we look at a single spectrum at this highest field, it's the spectrum shown in green, and we have two peaks here. So the six fold valley, whole de valley degeneracy is lifted into one that's two-fold degenerate in one state that's four-fold degenerate. And I will convince you of these degeneracies in a couple of slides, but you can clearly see there's already this splitting here of this six-fold degeneracy. And this splitting persists for all magnetic fields. We also find that it's independent of which orbital index of Landau level we're looking at. And so it's some single particle splitting we find that it does depend on large scale position in the sample. Um, and so that sort of indicates that it could be strain that's lifting this degeneracy here and preferentially lowering the energy of these states relative to these states. And so now if you look closely already in this color plot, you can see that there's some further features are broadening that's occurring as this level here is crossing zero. And so if we look at an individual spectrum now taken at this magnetic field, you can see that what was previously this fourfold degenerate state splits further. And this, this splitting here is occurring right as this Landau level is tuned around the Fermi level. And so this is some interaction driven splitting, which depends um, which further lifts the degeneracy of this state. And you can see it only occurs at this Fermi level. This gap opens, and then as we tune the magnetic field further, it closes again. So this is precisely this exchange gap that I was talking about, driven by interactions. And what's really unique in the system is we can quantify the role of the single particle splitting that occurs and this interaction-driven splitting here. <clears throat> 
And so from here, what we can say is, okay, so now we have spectroscopically, we can see the opening of these exchange driven gaps. Now, can we try to image these different broken symmetry states? And so what we do is here, um, look at conductance maps, map the variation of this tunneling conductance at the energies of these three different split Landau level states. And so if we take a conductance map at the energy here of this lowest um, broken symmetry state, here's a conductance map over some 200 by 200 nanometer area of our sample. And you can see, we see very clear ellipses of suppressed conductance here, and they're all oriented with the long axis vertically. Now, if we take a measurement in the same area of our sample, but just at a different energy, at the energy of this second peak here, now you see that these ellipses are all pointed diagonally in one direction. And similarly, we can take conductance map again in the same area of our sample, just at this third energy of this split peak here, and we see that these uh, we again see ellipses that are all diagonally pointed in the other direction. And so this is precisely this manifestation of nematic behavior where the lattice itself had initially the Fermi surface, you can think about it, had this threefold rotational symmetry, but the electronic states here now are picking a, prefer a preferred orientation for these different, at these different energies here. And you can see that these ellipses are rotated by 120 degrees relative to one another. And what's really, um, what was really interesting for us is we could then further say, okay, if we now tune the magnetic field to close this exchange gap between these two, the red and the blue peaks here, we can, um, then when we took conductance maps at the energy of this fourfold degenerate state, we now saw ellipses with these two directionalities superimposed. So this, this splitting here from this fourfold degenerate state to two doubly degenerate states is really an interaction driven splitting that was lifting this degeneracy from having these two different orientations occurring at the same energy to occurring at different energies. And so, this is a manifestation of the spontaneous symmetry breaking here. And what I'm going to show you over the next few slides is that what we're imaging, these ellipses, are actually individual Landau level wave functions that are pinned to defects in our sample. And, uh, yeah. Okay. So, actually, are there any questions at this point? I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, if you look, uh, if you go back a couple of slides. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the uh, the uh, electron Landau level uh, seems to cross the hole uh, where there is uh, some action occurring, right? Is that? Mm -hmm. Is that just a special case or is it always like that? Can yeah, you... that's, that's a very good question. Um, it, it is not always that it's crossing right through the center of um, one of these splittings, but it's a little bit, there are so many electron states or over some field range, it is always crossing at some splitting point, but I think it's not, necessarily something special that you have to have this electron Landau level crossing in order to see splitting. We do see for splittings away from any crossing of this electron state. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Can I ask also about um, the, the electron states? Uh, mm -hmm. do they have Landau levels too? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these um, these states here, these are from the electron, the central electron pocket gives you these Landau levels here that disperse with the opposite slope as a function of magnetic field. Just if you think about your band structure either having like a positive or negative effective mass, 
you think about it like that. And, and uh, does everything look um, parabolic-like or Dirac-like in terms of the magnetic field dependence? Mm -hmm. These are pretty parabolic-like. So even though um, the Fermi surface has these ellipses, if you look at the dispersion as a function of uh, momentum, they're to first order. You can approximate it as, a parabol as parabolic. So if I go back. So like something like here, this is your one mostly parabolic band and this is the other one. So at the gamma point and at, it, it's parabolic. And this splitting here is coming from spin orbit coupling, which gives you spin split band. So that electron like state doesn't have an additional spin degeneracy. It's just a singly degenerate band. Okay, so now moving on to one. I have a little question if that would be possible. Sure. Yeah, this is Jeff Quilliam from the University of Sherbrooke. Um, is there anywhere in here, is there a spontaneous symmetry breaking or uh, is the symmetry being broken entirely by strain? I, I... Right, okay, that's a great question. So I would say uh, here, if you look at this, this splitting here from this peak to this peak, this is some single particle effect likely from strain in the sample, but the splitting of this state, which is fourfold degenerate at 14 Tesla, and if we change the magnetic field, it then splits into two peaks. That is spontaneous in the sense that it's splitting only when this Landau level is partially filled. And um, it, then it closes up again. There are some subtleties in terms of there is likely some underlying strain which is determining what the lower energy state should be. But you can see that at, um, in the case where this peak is not split, you have these two different orientations superimposed. So there's this degeneracy, this fourfold degeneracy, which is now being lifted when these peaks are split. And so this is, this is what I was calling this manifestation of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Okay. okay, so then if it's spontaneous, then that would imply that I guess there should be some finite temperature transition, maybe? Yes. Um, have you explored the temperature dependence to see when this goes away? Or? Yeah, that's a very good question. The problem with the doing a temperature dependence is it also broadens the Landau levels themselves, and so it is hard for us to know whether this gap is closing due to a fact that we're killing this spontaneous um, symmetry breaking or whether the thermal broadening is just obscuring the gap that we can observe. But at, we, we weren't able to do a very complete temperature dependence, but at one Kelvin, we basically were not able to see this splitting anymore, but it's, it's not, definitive to us that we can claim that that's from the fact that, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, it's not clear that that's break, that's um, the temperature that's killing the symmetry breaking as opposed to just some thermal broadening effect. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so now briefly just to touch on what are we actually imaging when I say, oh, we see these ellipses here of suppressed conductance. And previous STM imaging in the quantum Hall regime uh, typically has looked at more disordered samples where then um, instead of being, in, so in these disordered samples now, the quantum Hall states are just following equipotential lines of disorder. And so what they're imaging is drift states. There have been some evidence of impurity shifted Landau orbits. This is an example in graphene from Eva Andre's group. And um, you can see that there are some Landau level states that are being shifted here as a function of um, right at some impurities, but what we were able to do in this system is look at a very clean 
a part of our sample and show that these ellipses here are centered on defects and we're not imaging disorder potential, but actually able to map out individual Landau orbits around these atomic scale defects. And so now this is in a different area of our sample where we have large region, which is these different colored regions are different step edges. And you can see in this black box, there are only two defect sites here. And so what we were able to do now is we focus only on one of the directions of the Landau orbits here, but look at different orbital indices. So looking at the n equals zero, one, two, and three, and four Landau level states. And so we can do conductance mapping at these different energies, all in the same area of our sample. And we see as we go from n equals zero to n equals one, and then two, three, four, you can see that these ellipses are centered around this defect is very clear and this defect is a little bit, the center is out of the field of view, but you can see the rings emanating from this point here. And as we go to higher orbital indices, you can see that the size of these ellipses is getting larger. And if you look closely, you can also see that there are more rings that are showing up. And so what do we expect? If we do a simulation for what the Landau level wave functions look like in the symmetric gauge, Essentially, we have two indices. We have the orbital index n, which just labels which Landau level you're in. So n equals zero, one, two, three, something like that. And then within each Landau level, it's highly degenerate. And this index m labels um, the different states within a particular Landau level. And so what I'm plotting here is magnitude of psi squared. And so when I say we're imaging Landau level wave functions were imaging psi squared. And you can see here that there's only one particular state that has weight right at the origin. So as we go to higher orbital indices, you can see that the number of nodes in the wave function increases, the number of rings that you see increase. And there's only this one state here with weight at the origin. Where this comes in now is if we model our atomic scale defects as some delta function potential, then what these defects do is they essentially shift just this one state, either up or down in energy. And so when I say we image at the energy, we take conductance maps at the energy of one of, like the peak of one of these Landau levels, what we're imaging then is this one missing state where that m equals n state has been shifted by the defect either up or down in energy. And so this is why our measured signal, we see these dark circles corresponding to one of these uh, wave functions here. And so we can further cross check that by saying if we now map at the energy where the state was shifted, we, we should see a bright feature with higher signal in the shape of this Landau orbit. And we were able to do that as well. And now Finally here, what we can do is really take a very high resolution image of just an individual Landau wave function. And you can see this is our experimental data and very clearly you can resolve the different nodes in the wave function, these different rings here. And it matches very well to a simulation for the n equals three Landau level. And now here, this ellipticity, how anisotropic the wave function is, that's just given by the ratio of the effective masses in the two different directions. And this simulation matches our data very well if we choose a ratio that essentially square root of mx to my is equal to five. And this matches ARPES measurements as well. So we can see we have this beautiful data which we can match very well to um, to our theoretical calculations as well. And although these calculations are fairly easy to do and they're straightforward, the data itself was just quite beautiful when it came in to have such high resolution data where you can really see these individual nodes of a wave function here. And now just going back to this idea of symmetry breaking, if we say we have a Fermi surface which has these six different valleys here, in the absence of any 
symmetry breaking, we would expect to see wave functions that have all these three orientations superimposed upon one another. And instead now, if we lift this degeneracy either into a fourfold and twofold degenerate Landau levels or three doubly degenerate states, then what we're saying is when we image one particular orientation of our Landau levels, that's reflecting the orientation of the valleys that are occupied at that particular energy. And so you can see in the case of the doubly degenerate Landau levels, we're essentially imaging states coming from pairs of valleys at opposite momenta that have the same anisotropy. And this is these pneumatic quantum Hall states. Um, we can also actually further look at singly degenerate Landau levels, like further lift this twofold degeneracy into two singly degenerate states. And we did study that as well, but I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to really talk about this work too much. Maybe I'll just give you a brief idea of there are two possibilities here. We could either have a valley polarized state when we lift now this doubly degenerate state and split it further into a singly degenerate Landau level. We could either have a valley polarized state. And this is where, because the valley itself is not perfectly elliptical, in this case, the um, electronic state itself would have an in-plane dipole moment and so be it would be a ferroelectric. But the other possibility is that we end up in a superposition of these two valleys here, in which case you would expect in the real space wave functions to see some periodic charge density wave modulation. And so experimentally, what we find is that we are in such a valley polarized state. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but just we can use our real space mapping together with this looking at spectroscopically at a splitting of these states to identify that we are in a valley polarized ground state, which we expect to be ferroelectric then. Um, and then I wanted to get to this last part of my talk, which is now saying, okay, we have these pneumatic domains. Can we find a domain wall between them and look at what's happening at the boundary between these different pneumatic domains? And so our first indication that we had domains was by looking at um, the different broken symmetry states. And if we take these measurements in two different locations that are separated about a micron away on our sample, we saw that the order of the broken symmetry states, like which direction the wave functions were pointing, was switched in these two different regions. And so that tells us that the lowest energy state in different areas of the sample is different. And so can we then find a domain boundary between these two, between such a, uh, such different domains? Um, and then there we want to look for these edge states. So here what we have is a large area of our sample, which in the topography is completely featureless. But now when we look at our conductance maps in this same area, just looking at differential conductance, DIDV, here we see a very striking domain wall. So on the right-hand side, you see that the Landau level wave functions are pointed in one direction. On the left-hand side, they're pointed on the other direction. And right in the middle here, you have this domain boundary. And now we expect that these domains, this domain boundary should have um, boundary modes. And so if we say that the on the left, valley A is occupied and on the right, valley B is occupied, then we expect to have these counter propagating modes here. And what we can do is then to study this domain wall, we can look at how the energies of these states evolve as we go from one domain to the other domain going across this boundary. And so you see here, this is a spectroscopic line cut. So essentially, I'm plotting energy as a function of distance taken along this black line here. And in each domain, we have this exchange splitting. So these states are split in energy around the chemical potential. And then as we go across this boundary, the states cross. And so you can think of this as some kind of topological gap twist as like very colloquial language. 
where essentially which valley is occupied is being changed from one side to the other. So in a cartoon picture, you can think of it like this. We have some exchange splitting that lifts the degeneracy between these two valleys. And on one side, valley A is occupied, and on the other side, valley B is occupied, which crosses up the domain wall. And now what we expect here, so this is why at the energy of one of these states, so this map here was taken at this energy here, and the domain wall shows up as having low conductance. If we take the map in the same area of our sample, but at zero energy, we expect to have large number of states right at this domain boundary coming from the crossing between these two levels here and indicating the presence of these counterpropagating modes at the boundaries. And that's what we see. So now what we can do is really change the magnetic field to tune the filling factor. And we find that if we tune the filling factor such that these levels are not split anymore, this domain wall disappears completely. And so at this magnetic field, we now see both these directions uh, superimposed upon one another. So these two different orientations of the valleys are now degenerate here. And in addition to just being able to um, have this domain wall disappear, we can also tune the number and off these boundary modes essentially by going between a case where we have either one set of counterpropagating modes or two sets of counterpropagating modes. And so I'm going to call these an effective filling factor of one, nu tilde equals one and nu tilde equals two. And the way to think about this is if we just consider these four valleys as playing a role, A and A bar and B and B bar, in this case, it's only one valley that's changing its occupancy as we go from one domain to the other. And in this case, it's pairs of valleys. So we can either have one single set of counterpropagating modes or two sets of counterpropagating modes here. And this actually gives us some very different physics in these two different cases, which is not something we had initially realized could be the case. So again, we tune between these two different um, nu equals one and nu equals two states just by changing the magnetic field. And we can look at what happens as we go across this domain wall in both cases. So on the left here, this is the, your singly degenerate state and a threefold degenerate state as opposed to having two doubly degenerate states slit around the chemical potential. And so in both cases, what we see is that this exchange gap here closes and then reopens as we go across the domain wall. And, oh, someone has raised their hand. Uh, yes, this is uh, David Sinishal here. Uh, just a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, you have domains and then within each domain, you have several speckles and spots. I mean, these are local defects, right? Yes. And, and then you have domains. I mean, these domains, are they, different from the point of view of strain or I mean, I'd like to understand what makes these domains? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there is probably some complicated strain profile underlying all of this, but the idea is that, I guess the point is when we don't have any lifting of this fourfold degeneracy, then we see no domains in this region we see these two different directionalities superimposed in our conductance maps. But when we lift this fourfold degeneracy here, what we find is the lower energy state on one side picks one of the valleys and on the other side it picks the other orientation. But like I was saying earlier, there is likely some underlying strain which picks which um, orientation is going to be your lower energy state, but it's not purely a single particle effect because if it were just a single particle effect, this, bro this broken directionality would persist for all filling factors and all magnetic fields. Oh, okay. So it cannot be just growth related to something. Um, so I think you could externally use strain to impose a domain wall if you wanted. 
but the domain boundary here that we see is due to interactions in that it only occurs when this fourfold degenerate state is split at the Fermi level. And this is important if we want to look at interacting effects occurring at the domain boundary. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Right, so now, great, okay, that very well leads into now, what's the behavior at the right at the domain wall in these two different cases, whether we have one set of counterpropagating modes or two sets of counterpropagating modes. And although you see here that this gap closes and reopens, if we look more carefully at individual spectra, in this case, uh, um, effective filling factor of one, nu tilde equals one, the dashed line is a spectrum taken away from the domain wall. And right at the domain wall, we see this green spectrum here, and these states are gapless. It's a metallic domain wall, which is what you would expect if you have these counter-propagating modes that are living right at this boundary. But now in the same location of the sample, if we look at this case where we have two sets of counter propagating modes, even right at this domain wall, we see that the spectrum is not gapless, but there's still some gap which persists. And this gap is smaller than the exchange splitting that we saw away from this domain boundary, but this behavior is gapped. And so we see this strikingly different behavior occurring in the same location of the sample. And so naively one might think, okay, perhaps it's disorder that's giving rise to this gap that we see. But if that were the case, we expect, since it's the same location of the sample, the disorder profile is the same in both of these cases. And so it's not disorder that's giving rise to that gap. And we see this gap occurring at multiple positions along the domain boundary. So that's what led us to then start thinking about, are there any interaction effects that are constraining the behavior at this domain wall and specifically including the valleys that are involved. And so very, um, I'm almost at the end of my talk, but let me just explain this part because this was really key insight into understanding this very different behavior at the domain boundary. So in the case of just one set of counterpropagating modes here, you would think, okay, any gap would open only if there was some kind of backscattering between them. But in this case, you have, if you have some state from A going to B and B going back to A, you're not really changing your initial and final states. And so this doesn't open up a gap in the case of mu equals one you could have some kind of four fermion interaction which takes two states from valley A into valley B, but these are actually exponentially suppressed when you consider the momentum transfer in the 2D Brillouin zone. And this involves a large momentum transfer. And so these types of interactions do not gap out the system because they're, they're exponentially suppressed in this case. However, if we look at the case where we have two sets of counterpropagating modes, then we can have an interaction which takes states from valley A to B and A bar to B bar. And now if we look at what that, what momentum transfer this involves, it's taking states from A to B and then A bar is the pair of valley A and A bar to B bar, this four fermion interaction has net zero momentum transfer. And it's precisely then these kinds of interactions which open up a gap only in the case of having this two sets of counter propagating modes with these different valley flavors at the domain boundary. And similarly, there are other um, interactions that are exponentially suppressed. But it's really having um, this ability to tune the number of edge modes at this boundary allowed us to change the interactions between them and go between states that were either gapless or gapped. And what was quite unique about this system is that it was, even though we were looking at these one dimensional boundary modes, it was really the momentum transfer in the 2D Brillouin zone that was constraining the interactions. And, um, along with Karthik and 
Sid and Shivaji Karthik came up with a new, uh, very nice theory to understand this from the perspective of thinking about Luttinger liquids in the case where you have to actually include the fact that it's not a purely one dimensional system, but these modes have an underlying uh, momentum coming from the valley degree of freedom here. So I'll ask you to talk to Karthik more about the theoretical side of this as well. But so with that, I'm just going to end and say this was bis this bismuth surface state, studying them in the quantum Hall regime really opened up a whole host of physics that we were able to observe, starting with looking at interaction driven valley ordering on the surface state, seeing these pneumatic behaviors, being able to use the STM to directly image the underlying Landau level wave functions, and then finally looking at these one dimensional boundaries between domatic domains where we could see a combination, see how the valley degree of freedom affected the interactions that we were able to observe. I guess looking more towards the future, it would be interesting to observe interactions occurring at Y junctions between all these three different orientations of the valleys that we have in the bismuth 111 surface. But also I wanted to just say that these anisotropic valleys is quite a um, generic Fermi surface that can exist and does exist and it's applicable to many different materials. So it's not unique to just bismuth. And um, on the imaging front, I think there's still a lot to do with looking for excitations in these systems, such as skirmionic excitations, and then ultimately trying to image fractional quantum hallway functions would be quite amazing. So there's a lot more to do, and it really brings together many different fields and ideas from topology, interactions, and symmetry breaking all together. So just a very rich system in which to explore. And um, with that, I'm going to end. And I'd just like to thank all my collaborators. This work was done in the group of Ali Yazdani at Princeton. I worked primarily with Ben Feldman on a lot of these experiments, who's now a professor at Stanford, and also with Hao Ding and Andras Ginish. The beautiful bismuth crystals we got from Bob Kava and he Wen Ji, and we had great theoretical support from Feng Cheng Wu and Alan McDonald on the first part of this work, and then Karthik, Agarwal, Sid Parameshwaran, and Shivaji Sondhi on these one-dimensional domain walls. Right, so with that, I am happy to take more questions. Yes, someone raised their hand. Yeah, I don't know if it's me, um, if I'm the one. Uh, I do have a question, uh, Michael. Um, thanks for this very nice uh, talk um, and also uh, uh, beautiful data. Um, so I, I was wondering about, you know, the the, the boundaries. So, so when you have this, um, what, what do you think defines where this boundary is? I mean, you're saying that you, you don't think it's disorder, but what defines actually the position of that boundary? And can you actually move it with some something else, let's say a parallel magnetic field, or uh, you would also think that if, if it's a boundary, which is due to, let's say, interactions purely, it, it should depend on the magnetic field or, or, or yeah, can, can you do something to, to this boundary, uh, wall, uh, wall boundary uh, to mm -hmm. study where it comes from or what it is actually defining its location? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are several different parts of an answer to that. One is strain. Could You could use strain to externally control where a domain boundary is existing in just because if you have strain along a certain direction, it would lower the energy for occupying, let's say, valleys pointed along the same direction as the strain as opposed to the other valleys. Um, in this case, we are not applying any external strain. This boundary is likely pinned by some underlying strain profile in the sample, but it's, I guess it's very weak. So you're never going to have zero strain in a real material, but that's what I was trying to show is that this boundary, even though it, the location might be determined by some small amount of strain, it's still 
only occurs when you partially fill one of these states. And so it's not that it's a single particle effect, pure, that it's a purely a single particle effect. Um, in terms of using an in-plane magnetic field, I think that would couple to the spin texture of these valleys, which are actually sort of complicated because there is spin orbit coupling involved, but I haven't thought carefully about whether you could move one of these domain walls with an in-plane magnetic field. So that is an interesting prospect to consider. But I would say strain is the first um, knob that comes to mind to be able to tune the location of this domain boundary. Thanks. Thank you, Chen, uh, Chen Hu, and then David Senechal. Hi, hello. Uh, so my question is that uh, the exchange energy of your degenerate states is uh, about two or three mini electron volts, and which is uh, much smaller than your lowest temperature, you, temperature energy you can achieve in your experiment. So, I, and so I'm wondering if this uh, such a small energy difference can be well distinguished or it will not be covered by the temperature influence? Yes, it is not covered. We have very good temperature. So our temperature, if you have a temperature of 250 millikelvin, the energy resolution, so one Kelvin is 86 micro electron volts, um, if you just do KBT. And so the exchange splitting that we see is on the order of like 500 micro EV. So we can very well resolve it. If you just look at the peaks, for instance, these peaks are well resolved at these temperatures. And so if we raise the temperature, you're right, that's when thermal broadening can wash out these features. But at our lowest temperatures of 250 millikelvin, uh, this exchange gap is around, it's even larger here, it's like 600, so this is point this is point four milli electron volts, so four hundred micro EV. So this is about eight hundred micro electron volts. Uh, okay, okay. So so it's not two hundred and fifteen MeV. It's a mu EV. That's so your 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 temperature, your your noise temperature. Our, our temperature is two hundred and fifty milli Kelvin. Okay. And then. If you do like 3.5 kT is typically your thermal broadening. So let's just say that gives you one Kelvin of thermal broadening. That's 86 micro electron volts. Okay, okay. so, so uh, my next question is that, uh, so if you consider a similar coupling, if we change another material such as graphene, which has a much smaller similar coupling, so what, mm -hmm. what will happen? So you, you can also expect the same uh, phenomenon or it will disappear? Right, that's a good question. So the point is the spin orbit coupling in bismuth and the specifics of it being bismuth is what gives you these anisotropic valleys. And because the valleys are elliptical, that's why the like Landau orbits that we see are also elliptical. In graphene, you don't have elliptical Fermi surfaces. They're uh, circular Fermi surfaces, and it's a Dirac uh, dispersion, not parabolic. That would change some things, but I think the biggest thing in terms of seeing this kind of nematicity is you need to have anisotropic Fermi surfaces. And so in graphene, you have a circular Fermi surface, so we would just see circular orbits. And in that case, then it, we would not be able to distinguish using this kind of real space wave function mapping, uh, like a lifting of a degeneracy and saying which valley is occupied, is it the K or the K prime valley? Okay, but the hexagonal netties is not necessary, right? We can also use orthogonal yeah. netties. Okay, so maybe yeah. the black uh, phosphorus can achieve this. It has a very large isotropic uh, uh, I think maybe it can. Black first for us. Maybe this yeah. can kind of achieve. Yes, yes, that is a good candidate to look at for this kind of. Physical. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Very good talk, thank you. Okay, uh, David? Uh, yes, um, I have a question about the electron pockets because you have in your diagram, the Brillouin's diagram, you have this single hexagonal pocket in the center, mm -hmm. and you have these very elongated pockets. Yeah. 
right? So, so which ones? I mean, it's, is it only the center effect that you see when you see those counter? Yeah, yeah, that, that is a very good, um, I can, yeah, that's a very good question. Maybe I can try to get back to the Fermi surface or maybe not so quickly. Um, we only see the electron states coming from this center pocket. We, uh, and the way we can identify that is both by looking at the energy at which the, we can extrapolate out the lowest Landau level and see what energy that's coming from. But also we can image the wave functions off the electron Landau level as well. And we see just more circular looking features. Those outer electron pockets, they might, if you look at, sorry, I'm trying to get to that slide. They might actually hybridize with the bulk band structure a little bit more. And uh, yeah, can you see this picture now? So these states here, this is what's giving rise to this outer electron pocket. And there might be some more hybridization with the bulk band structures, which make these features not as clear. So we don't actually see any um, Landau levels coming from these outer electron pockets. Yeah, great question. OK, okay uh, more questions? Uh, just a, a simple one about the, uh, uh, you said the calculation was done in the Landau gauge, but uh, you know, observable should be gauge independent. So yeah, what do you mean really? That, that's a great question. So those pictures that I was showing was in the symmetric gauge. And the reason why we pick the symmetric gauge is if you have these atomic scale defects, that is that has rotational symmetry. And so because we're looking at wave functions around those defects, that's why we look in the symmetric gauge, or that's why what we are seeing is also this rotational, rotationally invariant. Um, we had done some, I think one interesting thing to look at would be to say if you have a step edge that's a 1D line defect, looking at what the, the spatial patterns of the wave functions look like along there. And then you would want to use a different gauge to think about this. OK, so uh, thank you uh, very much uh, again. And I wish uh, you have a nice visit to, uh, with the rest, uh, rest of the day. So uh, let's, thank, uh, uh, let's thank Malika again. Thank you. Thank you so much.